Okay, hello everyone and Chomuri Apsua for uh, welcome to the eighth annual Cambodia Town Film Festival, the virtual edition. Uh, we thank you for joining today's panel, Memory, History and Documentary Filmmaking, part one. Please join me in welcoming some of our incredible filmmakers. We have Davy Chow. Hello, very nice to be here. Uh, Davia is a critically acclaimed French Cambodian filmmaker, most notable for his documentary Golden Slumbers and his feature Diamond Island. He's also worked with students to encourage the new generation of Cambodian filmmakers. We also have Arestia Rosenberg. Susai, happy to be here. She is a filmmaker with over 10 years of experience in film and television, branding content, and media. She's traveled all over the country and the world producing inspiring short documentaries. And she is the director of Tiny Tunes. Uh, we also have Linda Sapan. Thank you for having me. Looking forward to this discussion with all of you. Great. Uh, Linda was born in Phnom Penh in 1975. She fled the Khmer Rouge and went on to graduate from the University of Paris in 2007 with a PhD in social anthropology and a BA in Khmer studies. She's also the producer of the documentary, Don't Think I've Forgotten, directed by John Perosi. All right, thanks everybody. Um, Davi, I'd like to start with you. Um, first of all, okay. wow, Golden Slumbers uh, is really a tribute to the filmmakers of the Cambodian filmmakers of the golden era. Just it was so beautiful. Um, and we, I think many of us know how many, how few films were actually survived uh, the regime, mm. but um, your documentary really captured the total loss that occurred and it really did so in a beautiful way. Uh, I heard your grandfather, so Von Chan, was actually one of the major film producers during the 1960s, but you didn't learn this till you were a teenager, is that correct? And how did yeah. that shape your approach to the film? Yeah, basically that was the origin of the film for me because I, as you mentioned, I, I grew up in France and uh, let's say I was kind of um, not really in touch with my Cambodian uh, roots and background um, and I was educated in some kind of non-Cambodian, non-Asian neighborhood in, in France. And so I, I, I knew very little. And, and then somehow I, I got into film and like had this dream to become a filmmaker or to work in film industry. And when I started making my own short film on my own, and so that was at a young age of 17, 20 years old, I, I, I just remember that there was this story that this grandfather who I never met, the father of my mom, Van Chan, was into movies, but actually, yeah, I didn't even know what was his exact position. It was just knowing he was into, involved into movies, but that, to be honest, I was not like a big thing in my family story, I would say. Also because wow. again, we, we knew it all. And so wow. I started asking questions, yeah. And, and it's when I talk to my mom and talk to my aunt and sit and really ask direct questions that I understood that it, it was a big thing, Cambodian cinema in the 60s before the Khmer Rouge. And that my grandfather was really involved. But it's only when I finally fell into a blog that was at that time uh, managed by a Cambodian man who, who in his name is Hui Vatana, who moved to... France after the Khmer Rouge and it was maybe like the biggest movie lovers of Cambodian history and uh -huh. he was having that blog where he was writing all the biography of the actors of the directors of the producers and he was this treasure of information that you could find absolutely nowhere around and not in the internet nowhere there was not like solid text about that and that's how I discovered that Van Chan was considered as one of the biggest producers so that was very strange to me and that was kind of the moment where when I decided to go to Cambodia for the first time, that was in 2009, I was 25, with the idea of, let's see if I can make research and maybe at the end there's gonna be a film. And, and very honestly, at the beginning, I was thinking maybe kind of classically to make a documentary about my grandfather. It's gonna be something about that grandfather who I never met. But it was when I was in Cambodia meeting the very few survivors of that time, directors, actresses, that the, the movie um, translated or switched into something else that was really about a documentary about the lost memory of the golden age of Cambodian cinema. Yeah. 
Wow. And what was that process like to, to go to Cambodia for the very first time? You'd never been yeah. there and you're trying to track down like the very few people left. What, what was that like? That was crazy. And um, it obviously was a life changing experience to me because now I, I, it's been 10 years now that I, I live between Paris and, and Phnom Penh. But uh, at the time I was very young, I was very naive. I knew very little, I couldn't speak my, I, I knew very little about my culture and Cambodian oh, history. Wow. So I was very that kind of blind um, guy who was more French than Cambodian, I will say. And, but in the same time, I never met any of my grandparents. So I spent so much time with them that we really, really built some kind of very, I would say, honestly, family relationship. And, and also they all knew my grandfather. So they kind of adopted me in a way very quickly. And it was all after about getting to know them, but especially um, feeling when they are ready and when I am ready, especially to make the film because there was something to be kind of close. But some of them, I want to say the directors and the actors couldn't really understand what was my project because they could see how ignorant I was on the history, oh. I would say. And it was really after some kind of one year of getting to know each other, spending time and not only on the reserve of my documentary, but really like family time and spending time together, that I felt that they were ready. And when I say, okay, I would like to film you and you can tell me the story that you used to tell me when I go to dinner at your place and stuff, and we'd make the film. So that was really a very long, progressive human process, I would say, but extremely enlightening and, 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 and rich to me who was kind of, yeah, separated on that history. I just want to add something that Davi uh, says, uh, you know, the few yeah, uh, surviving people that are um, in Cambodia. But it's not just about uh, the survivor in terms of the person, but the, the, the artifacts, the, the, the film itself, the magazines, yeah. the history. Uh, one of the challenges when you're doing doc, uh, research or work in Cambodia, you have to speak almost three languages, Cambodian, French, and English. And yeah. then you actually be willing to travel because a lot of this memory, um, the people themselves, but those who actually brought with them their, in lo their luggage, their album uh, family, the cassette, the tape, whatever, and they moved, they immigrated to Canada, to France, to America, to uh, Australia. And the, 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 yeah. the, the, uh, the, any research in Cambodia almost required to follow the migration too, not just actually only the local. So that's one thing I thought, yeah. uh, it seems like what Davy says about his film is also for, I don't think I've forgotten, the need to go beyond than just the local and do research beyond. Uh, what is available in the archive. Absolutely. Well, yeah, I, yeah, I think it does relate with, with your research. I think that uh, in, in, in my process of doing things, uh, it definitely had this uh, kind of temptation to, to, to go also see what's going on abroad. And there is some survivors also of that history abroad. But I follow an intuition that I wanted really the, um, the research and the, and the film to really take place in, to take place in Cambodia. And I, I think it's because at the end, the film is not so much like about the history of Cambodian cinema as well, full of like information. There's not so many information I have in the film at the end, but it was really about kind of abstract formal question about the film has disappeared. We can't see them anymore, but do they still survive in a way in the country where they used to be? And that mm -hmm. brought me to film all places where used to be film studio or theaters, but they all turn today into restaurants or squats, habitation or karaoke, but to try to, to link the memory of the few survivors in the country and then the amnesia maybe of the places and to bring them together by the editing to see if there is some kind of, yeah, some kind of bridge that could be created by the editing through the film basically, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, that's beautiful, beautiful. Um, well, going on that too, it's like you have these films that were lost and a lot of them were, you know, there's beautiful works of art. And then there's also, you know, some of like Crocodile Man, who's kind of a B yeah. movie. It's kind yeah. of, you know, it's silly, but it's still, we, we would still agree that it's important to, to remember and to have. Yeah, well, I, I will say personally that obviously the, the first feature film produced by a Cambodian director was supposedly made in 1960, which is so late compared to other, mm -hmm. all the other countries, I will say, except yeah. for African country or Laos. So there was kind of a very late emerging film industry that for me, historically speaking, is absolutely fascinating because you have young people of 2025 
who didn't go to any film school and then just take 60 millimeter camera and they go back to the spirit of the early, yeah, the early invention of cinema by George Merliès or, or the Lumia Brothers, oh. which is full of effects, full of very naive ideas. So basically it was also a semi-amateur um, oh. film industry because obviously it was just starting. But having said that, you had directors who really had like a very, very strong instinctive talent that really their film were really comparable to big films and, and, and amazing films from that time. I, for example, I think of Tilim Kuhn, um, the Cambodian director who moved to, to the Montreal, Canada, and he made The Snake Man, that's his most famous film, but also a film like White Lotus. And when you watch this film, because he, he could save some of his films, the grammar, the visual language, the story, it's extremely crafted and very very good yeah i think that's the one thing for me in any field whether it's in film in uh, novels the, the Cambodian novel the, uh, the concept of writing in prose it started in the 30s 36 uh, and it's really very buddhist and painting and all this art form that emerged um it has to, it's just basically mm. and then it was disappeared or it was destroyed or was forbidden and then then you have also not just the end of the Khmer Rouge you have all this era right if, uh, uh, of um, the um, Vietnamese presence that actually, you know, still struggling. Yeah. Then you have also more civil unrest. So you have a long period of time. To me, it's like what is happening, uh, well, actually around the year 2000, uh, uh, the emerging explosions of all these possibilities as if like they are picking up where it was, but where it was compared to Thailand, compared to, it's very, very behind, but they're catching up. And I, I thank God for, I guess, internet and YouTube and all these things that allow them to actually, uh, I guess, absorb all that is available for them to learn. That is fascinating how much um, the resiliency of the artists in Cambodia have been able to um, cut on, on uh, and uh, that this really short amount of time it pays up to what's uh, happening in the West. I will say just the little that I know, and it's really wonderful to hear you share your story, Davey, um, and, and hear that perspective, Linda. I, my film premiered at the Cambodia Film Festival in March, and my local producer, Chenda Yen, she was introducing me to, you know, all the filmmakers and yeah. the writers there, and they were so young. She's like, this is like yeah. the hottest writer right now in Cambodia. And I'm like, that girl looks, <laughs> you know, and it was really cool, yeah. was really cool to see, like, like you were saying, the young people kind of run and, and teach themselves and be, you know, really up and coming filmmakers. It was really cool to see. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I always see some kind of parallel, of course, with that time of the 60s. Of course, the time is different. Now the um, access yeah. to images make the competition very strong because everybody can immediately see what people do and stuff and, and, and what is going on all, all around the world. But that's definitely the enthusiasm, the creativity, the electricity. It's something similar and, and yeah, we can dialogue with the time. Great. Wonderful. Um, thanks. Thanks, Davey, for, for that. Um, I'd like to move on to Restia with uh, Tiny Tunes, director of Tiny Tunes. Um, so I think, you know, I think a lot of us who are tuning into this have heard of Tiny Tunes. It's kind of, you know, um, just a fun, famous thing about that you like to hear. A good, positive story of these you know, kids being able to develop these skills and uh, gain confidence uh, in themselves while also, you know, giving back to the community in forms of entertainment and fun. Um, but I'd never really personally known the whole story behind it. And I'm curious, Arisha, how you came across the story and um, what made you think, like, I have to tell this? Yeah, you, you hit the, the head on the nail there. I, you know, Tiny Tunes as an organization, for those that don't know, it's a, it's a hip hop break dancing school for at risk youth in Cambodia. And um, it's obviously, you know, a wonderful thing, like kids hip hop dancing and wanting to get an education. But I was really moved by the founder and the executive director stories, which I do um, think gets lost a lot. And I felt really, I wanted to put the spotlight on that. And um, I found, I met um, KK in short when I was living in Cambodia a few years ago and came across Tiny Tunes at an event, you know, the kids were performing and I thought, wow, how cool. And I just kind of followed some instincts and wanted to visit the school. And I was there one day and the power was out. So, you know, the dancing was on hold. And as I was standing there and, and talking to short, um, I, I said, hey, your English is really good. And he said, yeah. You know, I said, no, no, it's really good. Like, how, where did you grow up? 
And he said, oh, you know, I grew up in the States. KK grew up in Long Beach. And that's kind of where I heard their story of, you know, not even being born in Cambodia and being born in refugee camps and making their way to um, America with their families. And then, you know, being an immigrant and being in poor communities and getting caught up in um, crime, they they went to jail as, as teenagers, kids, I mean, 16, 17 years old, mm -hmm. and then were deported because of those crimes back to a country they'd never even been to. And I was just really moved um, by that story. And, and especially with immigration being a, a hot topic in mm -hmm. um, states, you know, wanting to shed a light on that as well. And then not only that, but, you know, going back to, um, you know, your country, but instead of, uh, or not, I mean, you know, your country, your her your heritage country, again, not even being born there, but, um, you know, deciding to make the best of it and also give a shot to kids. And as KK says in the film, he says, you know, I thought I had it bad, but these kids here have it worse and trying to give opportunity to, to someone like him where he felt like he didn't have it. Yeah. Wow. That's, yeah, I, I really enjoyed hearing, hearing about that. Cause again, yeah. most of the time it is focused on the kids. So they are pretty, yeah. they are pretty fun, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're an incredible dancers, really beautiful stories there. You know, we do um, shine a light on a success case there as well as a current story. But again, wanting the focus to be around um, KK and Short's story, where I yeah. felt like I lost a lot. Yeah, there's been more um, deportations uh, in the past mm -hmm. six years than ever before. And uh, we won't get into politics, but <laughs> but yeah, it's been it's been a lot. And I think a lot of people have had that. Um, everyone, I think, in like around Long Beach in the Cambodian community knows someone that was deported for something very small and they have to pick up and uh, change their entire life. But you know, I don't want to go into politics, but I do want to discuss this is that okay. Um, in the 80s, when, uh, you know, after the Khmer Rouge happened, a lot of the um, uh, American and the senators said, we have to do something for the refugee. And they have the, created this special status uh, that allowed them to come without all the uh, paperwork and everything. Mm -hmm. But they give them a path to citizenship. So you have these people who arrived mm -hmm. saying that in no way, uh, you know, possibility for them to ever become citizen. And these other things with all the change of government. Uh, the idea that um, what is consistent of a felony, uh, possession of marijuana is one thing, and you could be actually deported because you have a few uh, grams of uh, marijuana, and, and that changed wow. uh, the, the restriction and make it even harder and giving more power to ICE. Uh, I think it was last year they actually expanded the number of uh, Vietnamese uh, and Cambodian to be actually deported. And I'm right, it's saying like they're not even born there. I remember my document, I, I, so I was born in Cambodia, but we went to uh, the refugee camp in Kavadang, and I still have the, my immigration form, and the uh, country of birth, it says stateless. I had no, like, how do they decide to deport me to Cambodia, except for the a document, official document, say I have no country, right? So it's really, uh, uh, it's not politics, it's a social issue that we need to discuss and say, mm -hmm. refugee, how do we decide to welcome them, and then suddenly we are not changing our mind because um, this is not, this, this must be a human way here in America and in terms of how to be a refugee. Yeah, and Linda, like you said, you know, they didn't have any support. You know, KK talks about no one told them, oh, this is a green card, but it's not a fully fledged citizenship. Like, you need to, yeah. this is what you need to do to get, no one told yeah. that. He didn't know, you know, his mother is a citizen now, but only when she lost him. And same with, you know, his parents were afraid to leave the house. Like nobody told them really how to live in this new country. They had no support. And, um, you know, Short talked about there was a church that sponsored them, but it was, you know, this weird arrangement. He felt like they, they'd like work on a farm. It was almost like strange um, labor rules and things like that. So, you know, I, it, it's just, yeah, the lack of support here really was, I think, the key in, in being successful in a new country, you know, and and yeah. there's a lot of stigma. I mean, different term like Cambodian returnees. Cam so you have the Cambodian who went to the refugee camp, who came back, that was in the 80s, 90s, and they were totally rejected by the Cambodian saying, you have failed. You have failed to go to another third country. Then you have these returnees who come back 
and they're even more being and, and the, the stigma of them and the social reintegration is so i mean i live in cambodia uh, uh from 2001 to 2008 and when i think about the struggle and i went back right i started to go back since 1993 when i see uh, actually one of the house i rented the, uh, a lot of the uh, um the uh, Cambodian returning wanted to re, uh, resublet the house from where I was, and I met them, and I just got their struggle to actually be accepted by the community, the people there. They don't see them. They don't see me as a Cambodian. They see me as a Japanese who speak well, well Cambodian. Mm. So they definitely don't see KK as a Cambodian, and that is yeah. like language, just looking at the appearance. And they said, you know, they were able to meet each other through a reintegration program back in Cambodia. I think there's some some 700 um, returnees that were deported back there. And, you know, little things like, you know, shorts like, I didn't have a, I didn't have a, an ID, a Cambodian ID, like, you know, I mean, just really the double struggle of coming back, as you said, was just really tough. Um, so, Arashia, was there anything like, you have you were able to pack so much in but was there anything that you that didn't make it to the final cut that you wish you had been able to explore further about their stories yeah definitely you know it was a, a 16 minute film that i think my first cut was 58 minutes so you know, it was as always a lot of work to kind of pare down i think just you know a little bit of what i explained here today just wanting to go deeper on the details of of what it must have been like to you know be in a new country and growing up there and then reintegrating back. I think mm. um, there's just a lot of uh, details there that I wanted to. And also I did film several students' stories and I would have loved to have told all of them, but you know, I had to, I had to cut it down. So yeah, mm. some really wonderful stories of, um, you know, KK talking about how when he first started the school, you know, asking kids like, what do you want to be when you grow up? And they're like, oh, I want to work in, you know, a pub or, you know, uh, you know, I want to get a good factory job. And now it's, I want to be a doctor and I want to have my oh, own, wow. you know, just the transformation of, um, of really instilling dreams into kids and the difference that that makes of just being able to dream and, and seeing a bigger possibility mm -hmm. for yourself. I would have loved to have talked more about that. Yeah, that was really nice. I remember when he was saying like, you know, you can't be a dancer for forever, like one in 1,000 will make it as a professional dancer. But then he also offered up other pathways, but you could do this, you could do this. And just seeing that kind of encouragement to where their eyes were open, like, okay, I'm dancing right now and this is really fun um, and I'm learning from it, but they they really did instill a sense of dreaming a little bigger for those. For those yeah, and, and KK talks about that being his regret of not focusing on school and his studies more. And I think that that's why it's so important for him to really instill that into kids and to and to have fun i think it's that balance of the arts and dreaming and also mm -hmm. um you know getting a really solid education and the pathways that that can provide mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great and what would you say was like your biggest takeaway from from the whole experience of of filming and creating this Gosh, well, I really, this was a, a, a real community effort to get this film made. Um, you know, it was an Indiegogo campaign for me to fundraise a lot of money. But honestly, um, the support that I had from the rest of the crew, I didn't, I, um, I shot it all with a Cambodian crew. Um, you know, my DP is incredible. He's had 25 plus years experience and was an absolute pleasure to work with. The footage is beautiful. And it was important for me to make to have a local crew make the film. But um, my producer, both my producers are American and my editor and my music guy and my, you know, my post team and they all worked for free. So, you know, I paid the Cambodian people their fair wages as part of the fundraising efforts, but everyone else was like, I love this story. I want it to be told. Everyone was really inspired by KK and Short and, and jumped in. So, um, you know, for any filmmakers that have passion, if people see it, they'll want to help, so. Yeah. <laughs> Question for both of you, uh, Alicia and Davy. Um, can you talk a little bit about your, the relationship you have with your subject in terms of trust? Because it, my experience there is that you need time to build a relationship for them to trust and open up. And once once they are um, the Cambodian, are they give everything? How was it your um, processes that you get for them to um, have that trust in you? Um, yeah, I'll just say quickly, you know, I, like I said, I met um, KK in short while um, living there for a little bit. And then when I left, I just, like I said, I 
thinking about the story, I knew I wanted to make it. <laughs> and, um, and so I started to put efforts and crew and team together just to see if, if I was going to be even be able to, to pull it off. And then that's when I approached them and said, Hey, you know, I'm really moved by your story. I think that there's a lot we can do to, to spread the message here and, and try to get some support. Um, and I wanted to have it be clear to them that like, this wasn't an NGO film, which I'm, I know that a lot of them had been made before and that that story had been told before yeah. that I wanted to tell a different side of the story and one that I felt was going to be more impactful and have more people be able to see it and be moved by them. Yeah. And perhaps that could help um, further the cause. And I, and I also want to say that, you know, 10% of every dollar that I raised for the film, I donated to Tiny Toons. That was important for me too, that mm. I include that in the budget. So, you know, I, I wanted them to know that I was on, you know, their side, that I was making this film as a way for me to use my talents to try to help in the little way that I can. And I'm attracted to the wonderful, beautiful story that I want to tell. So, you know, I was really clear about them, what, what I was up to. And I think they saw that transparency and also, you know, they, they were really smart. They said, you know, what have you done in the past? I sent them work samples so that they knew the kind of filmmaker that I was. And, and, um, and I was just very transparent the whole way. Um, and they let me hang out at the school for a whole week and have, you know, they were really great about giving me access to what I needed. Yeah, in my case, uh, as I was saying, I think it took me some time to get that trust and also some time to understand what was going on exactly. Because again, I, I got some very easy relationship and close relationship with the four main protagonists of my film, the three directors and the one actress, Lisavet. But, but when I was starting to talk with one producer, especially Liu Sring, about filming him, suddenly he started to panic and say, no, 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 why you want to do that? That's no, that's not, that's, that's not a good idea. And another one, Yvon Hem, who today passed away, um, he was extremely close to me. He was telling me many stories, but all, all the time I wanted to tell, to ask him questions about the past, he would kind of reject that to say, why are you always obsessed about the past? That's not so important that we should focus on the future. And I was kind of confused and not understanding really why I was like bringing a new uh, old poster from him that I knew he didn't have. And he was not so excited to see it. So actually that trust had to go through the fact to, for me to understand them. And I had to understand where this um, reserve and distance came from. In the case of Liu Sling, he, he, he kind of confessed me at one point that is because he lost all his films. He produced around 15 to 17 feature films and none of them have survived. So mm -hmm. he had learned since after the Khmer Rouge to not tell mm -hmm. anyone that he's a filmmaker because what will be the use? He has nothing to show mm -hmm. them. And then he kind of told me, but what if people don't believe me when I talk? That's why he wanted, didn't want to speak. So I, I had to really go to really understand the hurt of his, of his trauma, I will say actually, to be able to make him understand that that's okay. People will believe you. That sounds crazy, but that was his fear. And for Yvon Ham, it was, I would say even more tragic because that's when I understood that he had another, a first family who all died during the Khmer Rouge, his wife and his kids. And I, I didn't understand that because he had, a new family that he, he had after the Khmer Rouge. And when I understood that tragedy, I understood that for him, there is no happiness about talking about the past because when you open that box, you immediately think of the family that you have lost. So there was kind of this challenge. And I think there was exactly one, one particular moment when I got the trust. I started that research, I think in February, 2009. And it was only in November, 2009 that I created um, some kind of, little film festival about old films because on the 400 plus film that were produced from 1960 to 75 around 30 films are kept today and they were kept by amazing collectors and film lovers of that time but including young people like um, our friend Nate who was extremely helpful mm -hmm. on my film but also on John Pirozzi's film Don't Think I've Forgotten who is today a 30 year old um, American Cambodian American guy who grew up in the Bronx and after two lower and he was collecting all these films so thanks to them we have these 30 films and I was showing them in Phnom Penh for the first time for a very long time and it was full crowd all the time because it was like free and people were sitting on the floor and were just screening that on the white wall and when the protagonists of my film or my future film saw that and we organized big events for them to be at the center of the, great, the, the recognition that they felt and they maybe have not felt for a while make them understand that, okay, maybe we can, we can trust that 
ignorant kid to make the film. So we finally shot the film in March 2010. Yeah. But that, that took me a while to understand exactly what was the problem because I, I didn't understand at the beginning, to be honest. It's got to be hard to film filmmakers too. They're so critical. <laughs> oh yeah, that was that was crazy because yeah, yeah of course. Because I, this also I didn't expect, but I was starting to put the camera, and then some of them would come and say, "No, that's not the right way to do this." <laughs> like, hey, uncle, and of course, as as Asian or descendant of Asian, you're really into the respect of the elders and everything. So I really had to find my way to, to do. But that was very funny. <laughs> Oh, uh, thank you for that. Um, oh, Linda, so uh, we'll, I have a couple questions left for you. Um, you produced Don't Think I've Forgotten, which we had the pleasure of screening at CTFF uh, back in 2015. And I met your uh, director and husband, uh, John, then. Um, it was really, everyone was so moved by that film. It brought back so many memories for a lot of people just hearing uh, the music and uh, music has such an incredible power to um, bring up memories and really transport you back to a certain time. So it was really incredible. Um, just it's almost an encyclopedia. Uh, the film's almost an encyclopedia of, of the music that was uh, created and um, that was lost as well. I was also really impressed with the um, footage that you all found. Um, and you, and it looked the, just so incredible. Um, how, can you just explain how you found all that footage and where it came from and how you were able to make it look so beautiful? So uh, uh, some footage um, was shot by John uh, as a B-roll with um, Kodak. Uh, so he created um, um, a, um, the feel of the time. But a lot of the footage that we found uh, were from the um, Institut National uh, des Archives in France in Paris, and um, um, I have some frustration toward, um, 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 I'm really happy French have uh, uh, a lot of the archival footage, but many of the archival footage we found were uh, TV productions from uh, Cambodian, right? Cambodian uh, TV show, uh, uh, news anchor and all these things. These are just produced by Cambodian for Cambodian television and all these things. For whatever reason, the French people have archived it. So when we make the film, we have to pay full price to use archival wow. The French people did not produce, right? And anyway, uh, on this point, they have actually, uh, so we had to go back. Um, French doesn't have like in America where we have fair usage. So if you use like, uh, you know, you see some anchor uh, from uh, uh, Michael um, Concrete uh, talking and all these things, we could actually have this use free. Uh, NBC gave us that uh, uh, for a documentary film, but not in France, you, you, you didn't have that. Uh, and then we have, to, this is the, um, I guess the greatest challenge and fun is actually using all the network, right? Uh, from my network in France, all these asking uh, uh, family of friends and all these things and uh, getting them to have uh, their uh, family album, family. And we found like um, American who went just tourism, who went to travel and take um, find this village that is not actually um, uh, any relevance, but actually I think what the film uh, made not is not just about uh, the music, but also because Davies' film, The Golden Slumber, show us that there are no visual representations of what Cambodia was, what the film was. Because if we had this film, some of the film, you could say, oh, look how modern, how hippie. Okay, some of the films were actually, um, uh, you know, this mythology, but some of the films were also set in modern time. But because mm -hmm. we don't, that Cambodian doesn't have a, um, a image memory of what it's like. And the film was trying to actually give them a sense of what it is um, look like. And I, I, I know a lot of people and the elderly, as we've shown, have different experience to the music, of course, mm -hmm. but also like the, 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 mm. the wearing her white, uh, white, you know, boots, I go, go and all these things. A lot of them remember that. That was the fashion of the time, having the Vespa, right? Yeah. You went to rent a Vespa because everybody talked about the Vespa back then. <laughs> And, and that's bringing that, that memory, you know, because David talks about how the filmmaker don't want to talk about the past because the past has always been not always a positive one. And, and, and you know, the nothing I've forgotten has no surprise ending. Right? We, okay. we know what's going to mm -hmm. end. Right. But we wanted to the audience to show that, but before all of that, what, what, why was it so great, right? Why was it so great beyond the music? It was there was something happening in Cambodia. And, 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 and that was gone and that's just that part of the loss. And 
and through the archival research food. I mean, I sat hours and hours listening to Siano talk. <laughs> There's so much you can handle him. Uh, but listening to all these allow us to capture every aspect of it um, and give back to the Cambodian a visual narrative, their own, their own story of their own city. And, 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 and I think that was when we did this tour, because we did, we brought, we have giant and floated uh, screen, we go to tour from province to province. And you know, most of them not even listening. They're all chit-chatting, that's what they do in the cinema. But you could see the visual. Uh, I, I remember one woman, she was uh, talking on the phone with her daughter, saying, I'm coming home, I'm coming home. And she's sitting there and she keep on saying, telling to her daughter like, oh, this is amazing. Look at the dress, look at the, <laughs> <laughs> the image, right? And, 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 and I think to me, uh, one of the pride is giving back that memory of, uh, uh, for the older generation and for the younger. And that is right when saying that some people, they won't believe. And some people, some younger ones, won't have a hard time believing that the Khmer Rouge actually existed. You go to certain problems, they just go like, that is not, because it was not taught until 2009 in uh, school. The textbook was not acknowledged. So they started to think this is a myth. And, and it's so important that we give them back a visual representation, even though we didn't go through much of the Khmer Rouge, but to tell the story, I think that's why the film took so long. We tell full story. <laughs> yeah. And the political history of the country to give that sense. And that's why the history of the country, there's a lot of books done. The, the history of the music, that was a part that we struggle more. And building trust, like Davi uh, and all of you talk, um, it was really hard because of, um, so we have some people, they're not in the film, they survived simply because um, they're not, they were too traumatized and we didn't feel comfortable pushing them. Some other the people, by the time we found out who are, they are, uh, where they're locating them, they passed away. Uh, and, and some, because um, documentary film or film is a visual, uh, there's, no, there's no music of them that survive, or, and there's no photo or image of them survive. Just so how can we tell a story of them? And then, because we have so many other, and, and we feel sad, for example, we didn't have so much about the Apsara, like band. Um, mm -hmm we didn't have any recording and image that we could find surviving. So, uh, so as you know, filmmaking, we make choice in the, what is available, um, but it's also building trust with the community so that they believe in the storytelling, right? Like Arish has mentioned, a key word is not an NGO film, right? And we have a history of that. It's a problem right. and a relationship to that. So it's not about saving them and all these things, but it's just treating them as artists not as we are there to save them and by that we give them dignity that's beautiful so uh we're gonna wrap up i have one more question for you then linda um looking at the past and this time capsule that you've created and the importance of remembering that history looking back now what would you say to um future cambodian filmmakers who want to look at the past but also um, bring it to their art today? I really think, I, I think that, um, I think they should not be burdened by the past, right? Um, but they need to have understanding where they come from. Um, non Pen in Cambodia has um, uh, all these new organizations uh, that is non um, you know, profit NGO, whatever, uh, for the arts and I think they always say, we are the first one to do this. We are the first one to do the festival on this. We are the and please do a bit of research. Like Rayon did it maybe in 2000, uh, 1999, the first collaborative exhibition. So if you understand what have done before, it's not a competition. You get that information, you get that uh, wisdom, get that experience, and then you could do something more interesting. So telling a story, uh, you, you know, feeling that, I think Cambodia is like, you never have that feeling that you have maybe in the West where you feel like everything's been told. I think Cambodia is like so much, so much more. <laughs> Tell. Like there's so many stories that uh, uh, you know you just always uh, alone. She said there's so many other stories we could tell, um, but I think you need to a little bit understand and just like Davi, right? Just trying to find out the story behind, and if you learn from that and 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 and, and stop saying we are the first one or stop saying that yeah I make my one project and then now I, I'm an established filmmaker and established. Um, I think it's a lifelong journey of learning. And, 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 and discovery, so, and, and, and tell your story. Whatever, um, you know, whatever your budget, whatever the means, um, 
the more you tell the story, the more we will be able to have our understanding and, and love it. And then you could improve on your process in the art form and we get to hear it. That's beautiful. All right, everyone, Akun, Akun Jaran for joining us today. Um, thank, thank you all much. for um, imparting your experience and your wisdom. And I'm sure that our uh, viewers are also enjoying that as well. Okay. Thank, Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you. Everyone. What a privilege. Thanks so much.